Hello, welcome to BEH 229 Family Counseling. Today we're going to be discussing diversity and family functioning. So before we move into the family part, let's talk about diversity. Any attempt to understand individual family functioning must be take we must take into account a variety of diverse influences that shape the lives and experiences of women and men gender race ethnicity culture sexual identity spirituality and socioeconomic status are all recognized as powerful influences on personal and family perspectives and behavior patterns so a person who is growing up African American living in say for example Alabama is going to have a much different experience than someone who is African American and growing up in Philadelphia. Um, same thing with spirituality. Somebody who is Mormon growing up in Utah is going to have a much different perspective than a someone who is Roman Catholic growing up in New York. So you know we have to keep in mind that people's entirety of their experience make up who they are. Not only do these forces shape the characteristics of clients, they also inform the way therapists understand and perform their work. Many mental health practitioners have extended their interest in social, political, and historical forces to include a professional commitment to understanding therapy as a means of achieving social justice. So if you think about some of the postmodern um, perspectives like feminism, uh, there is this perspective that you know if you don't feel like you've had the opportunities to achieve something you have to go backwards and look to where you're coming from so that as you move forward you can achieve social justice you can achieve your goals you can achieve all of those things you just have to understand where these people are coming from Gender, culture, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status must be considered in relationship to one another by a therapist who tries to make sense of a client family's hierarchical arrangement or the family's social attitudes, expectations, or relationship to the dominant culture. In some cultures where the father is clearly the boss of the family, there's going to be a much different perspective than in other cultures where the mother is definitely the boss. Culture is learned knowledge, attitudes, and behavior transmitted from one generation to the next. It affects families in various ways, some trivial, others central to their functioning. It is interwoven with our world view. Language, norms, values, ideals, customs, music, food preferences are all largely determined by cultural factors. Even a meal such as Thanksgiving uh, in the United States where turkey, stuffing, mashed potatoes, those kind of things are all the standards. Cultures bring different aspects in. For example, you know, if you go to an Italian family's house um, for Thanksgiving, there's often ravioli or lasagna in addition to the turkey and stuffing. Um, if you go to a household that's recently immigrated from Asia for example anywhere in Asia you might see rice on the table as opposed to mashed potatoes culture is more than just food though culture is also about the way we see the world and those aspects color everything in our minds to be fully competent a therapist must take into account his or her own cultural background socioeconomic status race ethnicity sexual orientation, religion, life cycle stage, and so forth in working with families from different backgrounds. The therapist must be especially alert to how these factors interact with those same factors in the client family. So the more you learn about a person's culture, the more you understand the whys. Understanding families requires a grasp of the cultural context, i.e. race, ethnicity, religion, socioeconomic status, and sexual orientation. 
in which that family functions and the subsequent cultural norms by which it lives. Efforts are underway to develop a culture-sensitive therapy, one that recognizes, for example, that the white middle-class cultural outlook from which most therapists operate, which prizes individual choice, self-sufficiency, and independence, is not necessarily embraced by all ethnic groups that therapists come into contact with. For example, in many Asian families, for example, interdependence as opposed to independence within the family is expected as it is that family members will subordinate individual needs to those of the family and society at large. So if you have someone who comes from you know, the Philippines, China, Japan, Thailand, and they seem to be overly self-sacrificing, you know, sacrificing their own goals in order to make the family more productive, that is a cultural expectation that we have to wrap our mind around because we cannot apply what we see as the right way or the American way to do something as the only way. And that's really the key is just because we're American doesn't mean it's the only way to do things. Acculturation. So, the evolving view of cultural diversity recognizes that members of racial and ethnic groups retain their cultural identities while sharing common elements with the dominant American culture. This is also known as acculturation. Acculturation is an ongoing process that occurs over multiple generations as families confront changing gender role expectations, child rearing practices, intergenerational relationships and family boundaries within the dominant culture to which they have migrated. At the same time, immigrant families often must face changes in social level to lower status jobs, ethnic prejudice and discrimination, the acceptance of minority status in the new land, and in some cases the fear of deportation. Individual family members differ from each other in their degree of acculturation as well as in their adherence to cultural values. So family immigrates to the United States. The younger you are, the more likely you are to um, acculturate all of the American values. The older people may have a harder time, but they do try to fit in mostly. And when we're looking at these kinds of situations, you know, you have circumstances where somebody is a nurse or a doctor in one country, but they come to the United States and their licensing is not sufficient. So they may either have to go back to school or they have to um, take a serious test. So somebody who is working as a doctor in one country may come over to the United States and end up working as a nursing assistant because he doesn't have the right credentials. and as their status if their job goes down so does their socioeconomic issues because they're not as you know nursing assistants are not paid as well as doctors culturally competent therapists take client cultural histories into account before undertaking assessments forming judgments and initiating intervention procedures hernandez siegel and alameda offer a cultural context model for working with families from different backgrounds. The model uses three processes to facilitate change in therapy. A. The development of critical consciousness. Two. A deepened sense of empowerment. And three. Accountability. These processes help in the four domains of family experience which are conversational, behavioral, ritual, and community building. The United States is an increasingly heterogeneous society, a pluralistic one made up of varying races and ethnic groups. The majority of the total population growth in the United States between 2000 and 2010 was due to the growth of the Hispanic population. Moreover, the Asian population had the highest group percentage increase, 43%, and increased to 5% of the total population. 
One way to assess the impact of a family's cultural heritage on its identity is to learn as much as possible about that specific culture before assessing the family. Taking gender, social class position, sexual orientation, religion, and racial or ethnic identification into account, a comprehensive understanding of a family's development and current functioning must assess its cultural group's kinship networks socialization experiences, communication styles, typical male-female interactive patterns, the role of the extended family, and similarly culturally linked attitudinal and behavioral arrangements. So the more you know about a particular culture before you even meet them, the better your understanding of their network is going to be. Taking gender, social class position, sexual orientation, religion, and racial or ethnic identification into account, a comprehensive understanding of a family's development and current functioning must assess its cultural group's kinship networks, socialization experiences, communication styles, typical male-female interactive patterns, the role of the extended family, and similarly culturally linked attitudinal and behavioral arrangements. So, you know, this kind of copies over what we saw in the previous slide, but this one really kind of demonstrates exactly what six elements we need to look at when we meet a new client. Um, you know, for example, in some cultures, men are in charge. In other cultures, women run the household and men follow the rules of the household. Um, the extended family, you know, we talked about how some cultures see extended long-term friends as part of their family unit. Other groups don't see that. So there's going to be other specificities in there that will allow you to um, get to know the culture of the clients that you're working with. Family therapists must try to distinguish between a client family's patterns that are universal, i.e. common to a wide variety of families, culture specific, common to a specific group, such as African Americans or Cuban Americans or same-sex parents, or idiosyncratic, unique to this particular family, in their assessment of family functioning. In this regard, Boyd Franklin notes that unlike the dominant cultural norms, African Americans adhere to cultural values that stress a collective identity, family connectedness, and interdependence. Her research with African American parents reveals their special concerns about their children, particularly their sons, survival issues such as racial profiling, the disproportionate number of African American children tracked into special ed and juvenile justice programs, drug and alcohol abuse, gangs, violence, and so forth. So, you know, how many parents, white American parents, have to sit their sons down at 13 or 14 and say, if a cop pulls you over or wants to talk to you, you say, yes, sir, no, sir, you do exactly what you're told. Most white parents don't have to do this because cops generally do not see young white kids teenagers as dangerous whereas they see african-american kids as dangerous which is completely not supported by statistics it's just this perspective that well you know if he's a young black guy he's going to be part of a gang and it's that thug mentality and that's completely against all of the real statistics that are out there. So while gaining awareness of differences regarding ethnicity or racial characteristics of a specific group is typically helpful, there is also a risk in assuming uniformity among families sharing a common cultural background. Even if they share the same cultural background, different families have divergent histories, may come from different socioeconomic status, or may show different degrees of acculturation. So, you know, did the family immigrate 20 years ago, 10 years ago, or last year? Um, are the families wealthy? Are they middle class? Are they lower income? 
there's all kinds of elements that go inside and that's what's so fascinating about counseling is every single person you meet is going to be unique because every single person is unique in some way you know they've had different experiences they've seen the world through their own eyes and their own filters ultimately the therapist's task is to understand how the client family developed and how they currently view their culture in working with acculturation and adaptational issues with immigrant families therapists need to take care to distinguish between recently arrived immigrant families immigrant American families foreign born parents American born or American educated children and immigrant descendant families each has a specific set of adap adaptational problems whether they're economic educational cognitive affective or emotional acculturation has been found to involve differences in each family regarding the combination of the culture of origin and the adoption of elements of the new host culture family processes may mediate acculturation effects on the development of behavior problems and depressive symptoms therefore it may be beneficial to tailor interventions to the specific cultural characteristics of the family in therapy so as I had mentioned you know there's as unique as every person is so is every family and this uniqueness gives us perspective into how we can work with them and get them on track where they feel comfortable so let's talk about gender which is such an important element in today's society men and women experience family life both similarly and differently in their families of origin and in the families they form through marriage or partnership typically they are reared with different role expectations beliefs values attitudes goals and opportunities generally speaking men and women begin early in life learn different problem-solving techniques cultivate different communication styles develop different perspectives on sexuality and hold different expectations for relationships so for example you know I was growing up in the 70s and my family was hardcore Roman Catholic and women were supposed to defer to men and despite my absolute inability to understand why my mom basically said you know the men feed the men first before yourself make sure they're happy before you're ever happy yourself and so on and so forth clearly as I grew up I didn't agree and I kind of went in another direction that way <laughs> um, so you know gender expectations are not only significant between culture but also between the generations men may be disparaged if they appear to passive emotional sensitive or vulnerable qualities that are considered the province of women the pairing of an overtly bossy woman and a meek or compliant husband often provokes discomfort in others and subsequent hostile or demeaning remarks because of its unexpected role reversal whereas if we have a bossy husband and a compliant wife we are more comfortable with that because that is what we saw growing up in, on TV maybe in our own homes so on and so forth these gender differences in perception and behavior result from a complex interaction process between culture and biological forces as Knudsen Martin observes despite efforts to promote gender equality many inequalities continue to exist and result in overt and covert impacts on family life while the broad strokes of men's lives seem to follow a more or less direct course largely laid out to them early in life by social expectations and indoctrination women's lives in general may seem more varied and this is because women typically experience more starts stops interruptions and detours as they are called upon to accommodate to the needs of parents husbands children and other family responsibilities so whereas a man is expected to grow up go to college get a good job get married have children you know women 
depending on their circumstances, they may have to leave their job to have a baby. They may choose to stay home with their children while they're young, you know, for the first five years before they go to kindergarten. And this forces the woman to step out of the job market, which she is then punished for because there's this five-year gap in her resume. The issue, though, that we're looking at is that men and women have very different expectations placed on them. And some of them are biologically based. You know, at this point, men cannot get pregnant and have children. Women do. And for society to continue, women need to keep having children. But society punishes women for doing this oftentimes. And this is where you see a lot of the conflict in society. The larger social, historical, economic, and political context of family life in a patriarchal society generally was overlooked. The therapists, by and large, felt comfortable taking a neutral stance regarding a family's gender arrangement, thus running the risk of tacitly approving traditional values that were oppressive to women. Attempting to correct this gender bias, these feminist-informed therapists began to challenge the social, cultural, historic, economic, and political conditions that shaped not only the unique development and experiences of women, but also their relationships with men. The Women's Project in Family Therapy, co-led by Marianne Walters, Betty Carter, Peggy Papp, and Olga Silverstein, began in 1977 and continuing for almost 30 years examined gender patterns in family relationships as well as patriarchal assumptions underlying classic family therapy approaches. For example, when mom and dad get old and sick, who is expected to look after them? Their daughter or their daughter-in-law. Very few parents of a particular generation look to their son to take care of them. This project had enormous influence in the field, moving family therapists to look beyond what is occurring within the family and to consider the influence of broader social and cultural forces. The entry of women at all socioeconomic levels, whether single, cohabitating, married, or head of single parent households, into the world of paid work has had a profound effect on evolving male-female relationships. Now, I'm not going to go into a deep history lesson, but it was not until World War I, otherwise known as the Great War, and World War II, that women were at all considered to work outside the home unless they did domestic service, i.e. be maids at people's houses or teachers. Um, after that, after World War II, you had women who had been doing the job men had done and did it successfully and now their husbands came home from the war and they were forced to go back into the household. However, once you let the genie out of the bottle, you can't get her back in necessarily. And women began to enter the workforce on a consistent basis leading up to the 1970s where women sort of broke through and started moving into management positions, professional positions, and so on. By the 1980s, young women were expected to go to college, get a job, have a career, and a family, and do everything that was expected of them, all the while being super in everything. And now, in this era, women are fighting back. They're saying, nope, we can't do everything. Men have to help. Husbands have to help. Society has to look at what we're expected to do and fight back a little bit and say there has to be a breaking point. So breaking out of stereotypical male-female roles regarding domestic and work responsibilities is essential to contemporary family therapy. Working wives continue to bear the major responsibility for child care and most household chores, although men now are more involved in the rearing of preschool children and helping with daily domestic tasks than in the past. But Women are still doing 70 to 80 percent of the housework that has to be done and 70 to 80 percent of the 
child rearing and child looking after the children that has to be done. Women are likely to take on the major obligation of caring for sick children or elderly family members, maintaining contact with the families of origin of both partners and sustaining friendships. So not only are women working outside the house, but they're also working inside the house. They also have to be the social secretaries and the party planners and everything else that goes along with that. And this is why so many women are unhappy in their marriages. It's not their husband necessarily, it's the expectations that society places on them of what they are expected to do. Then we move into the empty nest time, when the children leave home. With, men, with the children out of the house and forming families of their own, men and women may find themselves with differing priorities. Men may wish to seek greater closeness to their wives, while the latter may begin to feel energized about developing their own lives, perhaps through resumed careers or other activities outside the, ho the home. If serious marital tension leads to a divorce, it sometimes does at this stage, McGoldrick and Associates contend that women are especially vulnerable. So not only are they less likely than men to remarry, but their embeddedness in relationships, their orientation towards interdependence, their lifelong subordination of achievement to caring for others, and their conflicts over competitive success may make them especially susceptible to despair. Furthermore, women are more likely to outlive men and may find themselves alone and in fin financially impoverished in their later years. So, you know, after the children leave home and women oftentimes will try to get back into the job market or they are moving into that retirement era and their husband has certain expectations that may not meet the expectation the wife has. And at that point, that's when negotiation has to go on. Otherwise, you know, if there is a divorce, the woman almost always suffers the worst. Men have been subjected to substantial role constraints and disadvantages as a result of their masculine socialization experiences. They too may have suffered from sexist therapeutic interventions that have condoned restricting men to a narrow range of family roles, such as a breadwinner, while robbing them of the experience of participating in roles, say child rearing, usually assigned to women. Men's studies extend feminist exploration by examining role restrictions in men's lives. These socialized gender restrictions may hinder individual or interpersonal fulfillment. Fear of femininity results in socialization and norms that program men towards curtailed emotional expressiveness, conflicts between work and family, restricted affectionate behavior between men, and concerns with success, power, and competition. So oftentimes men will say that they never had um, a deep relationship with their father. You know, they never heard their father say, I love you or hug them. And, you know, the, the reality is when you're eight or nine years old, it doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl. If you're upset, getting a hug from your parent is a very comforting experience. The idea that it makes you girly is ridiculous and we're finally beginning to understand that some of these um, gender role expectations have been distorted and have worked against men in the long term. O'Neill documents extensive research in multiple cultures over the last 30 years that find that gender role conflict is significantly correlated with more than 70 intrapersonal, i.e. depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and interpersonal, i.e. lower capacity for intimacy, lower relationship satisfaction, psychological problems, and racial identity, culture, acculturation factors interact with gender role conflict in a complex way. Whether warranted or not, men have a reputation for avoiding and even demeaning therapy, often because it is seen as a weakness to talk about one's problems. 
Consequently, stereotypes about men and women may negatively affect therapeutic interventions. And this little uh, picture I have on the screen, this is a joke. This isn't real. Um, but the point is, is that we have these stereotypes. Society does. And, you know, the reality is that's not what our brains actually look like. That's just what we think we're focused on. You know, the rate of suicide in this country is extremely high. And the vast majority of successful suicides are done by men. And the reason for that is, A, they don't generally talk about their problems. B, they generally won't take antidepressants or anti-anxiety meds because they feel that makes them weak. And C, men love guns in general. Not specifically, there's always going to be specific men who do not like guns. But guns are very easy to get in this country. And when you put a gun in your mouth and you pull the trigger, there's not much chance that you're not going to die. So um, men are much more likely to commit suicide and doing it with a weapon that's going to ensure they're dead. One interpersonal area in which gender, asymmetrical power, and control intersect is family violence and sexual abuse. Masculine gender role norms play a role in such violence. Substantial research indicates significant evidence for the relationship between adherence to masculine gender roles and intimate partner violence and certain types of violence, i.e. psychological, physical, sexual, may relate specifically to particular types of masculine gender role stress. To be successful, any anti-violence program must be gender sensitive and include the preventative anti-violence resocialization of men so that they will not rely on violence as an interpersonal strategy. So, you know, if you grow up in a household where dad is prone to violent rages or, you know, putting a hole in the wall with his fist or screaming at mom, hitting people, um, any kind of abuse, you know, you're going to grow up thinking that's normal. And as a man, when you grow up like that, you're going to believe that's an appropriate way to demonstrate your own frustrations. Therapy from a gender sensitive perspective is intended to liberate and empower both male and female clients, enabling them to move beyond prescribed roles determined by their biological status to ones in which they can exercise choice. It is gender sensitive therapy is action oriented and gender sensitive family therapy proactively helps clients recognize the limitations on their perceived alternatives imposed by internalizing these stereotypes. So this little comic here on the right, in the first top left, it, uh, the husband is writing a um, article about the wage gap. Mom is standing behind in the doorway. She has a baby strapped to her in one of those Bjorn things and a little boy who obviously looks just like the dad. In the next frame, she's saying, I'm going out, I have to meet with Junior's teacher, do groceries and pick up dry cleaning and, and meanwhile, the husband is typing something that says the wage gap mostly disappears. And then in the next, he says to her, oh, by the way, the nursing home left a message about my mother, would you take care of that? And then he's writing, the wage gap mostly disappears when you control for the fact that women work far fewer hours than men. And this is exactly the issue we're talking about in terms of how much a woman has to take care of. She's taking care of the children. She's taking care of her job. She's taking care of her house. She's taking care of her father's parents, her own parents. And then his last thought is, hope she makes stew for dinner tonight. Again, reflecting on the fact that, that women are seen, you know, stay-at-home moms especially are, are, are terribly underestimated because they're seen as not working. Well, they never stop working. And that can be exhausting in and of itself because 
there's always something to do, especially when you have children in your house. Socioeconomic status. Men and women in each so socioeconomic class experience life differently from one another, differently from their counterparts in other classes, and differently from the others of the same class, but from another cultural group. No one group is monolithic. Not all African Americans are poor, not all whites are middle class. In actuality, most of the nation's poor are white, although people of color are disproportionately represented among the poor. Increasingly, it takes two parents and two paychecks to maintain a household's grip on middle class status in the United States today. Despite our society's cherished myth that we are all middle class or have equal opportunity to become middle class, the facts indicate otherwise. More than 14.5% of all American families live below the poverty line, and that comes to about 45 million people, and many more live just above it. Almost 20% of the children in this country live in poverty, and almost 10% of seniors aged 65 and above live in poverty. So we're looking at a very significant number of people in this country who live in poverty, who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Kelman notes that the persistent effect of social class membership because it impacts health, i.e. access to health care and utilization of services when needed. If you don't have health insurance, you have to go to a free clinic. If you go to a free clinic, the time that you get with a doctor might be less than five minutes. So you're not getting a true assessment. Other issues, diet. You know, if you live in an urban area without a lot of grocery stores, this is called a food desert. And food deserts are where there's not a lot of fresh fruit, vegetables, meat. Think about you know, a terrible part of a city and how there's no grocery stores. Where do people get their food? They go to the Wawa, they go to the 7-Eleven, they go to the bodegas on the corner. Ultimately though, it's hard to get good food when you are poor. The ability to make long-term decisions versus required focus on immediate needs. You know, planning for retirement is not a big deal if you do not know how you're gonna feed your children that night and employment conditions. For instance, the comparison of executives who can work well past the age of 65 because their work conditions do not require physical exertion versus those forced to retire on limited funds because they are unable to continue to perform manual labor. Aponte emphasized the creation of what he terms underorganized rather than disorganized families. Living in such situations through generations, families of whatever racial background learn to live, to learn to view as normal their own impotence. You know, if you, if grandma was poor and mom was poor and you're poor, you may see life as not a ladder to success, but a pit of despair and there's no way to get out of it. They are forced to accept their dependence upon communities' network of social institutions, including welfare, public housing, publicly funded health care, without the necessary political or economic power to out influence outcomes. You know, one of the biggest questions we look at every election is why do really poor white people vote against their best interests? They vote for politicians who want to get rid of welfare, who want to get rid of public funding for health care, who want to get rid of public housing, and yet they rely on these things for their day-to-day -day existence. And a study was done where they discussed that these people, even though they rely on these social programs, they don't want to rely on them. So the idea of voting against them in some way helps them deal with their cognitive dissonance of not wanting to be on the social program but having to rely on it. Where fatherless homes predominate, roles lose their distinctiveness and children may grow up too quickly 
while being at the same time intellectually and emotionally stunted in development. You know, if mom is working two jobs just to make the bills and put food on the table, then, you know, the parenting role often goes to the oldest child. And that oldest child may only be a year or two older than the next child in line. So, you know, mom becomes essentially the person who provides the money for food and rent and everything else, but it's the oldest child who's really the parent in that family. The family therapist, likely to be a professional or managerial class in, vo in viewpoint, if not necessarily in origin, must be careful not to regard being poor as synonymous with leading a chaotic, disorganized life. It is essential to distinguish between those families who have been poor for many generations, victims of what a Ponte calls structural poverty, poor intermittently or temporarily, such as being a college student or while divorced but before remarriage, or recently poor because of a loss, such as unemployment or the death of the major wage earner. It also helps to be aware that some poor people, including those who are chronically unemployed, share middle class values regarding such things as work and education, while others embrace more survival based values of the working class as a result of their life experiences. Above all, any efforts to equate poverty with psychological deviance first must take into account the harsh and confining social conditions usually associated with being poor. Many therapists are concerned with the impact of gender, race, ethnicity, social class, economic status, sexual orientation, spirituality, religion, disability status, and immigration status, and they've identified the role that therapy could and should play in the support and deepening of social justice. Social justice can be understood as the fair and equitable distribution of advantages and disadvantages within a society to all people regardless of their status. So for example, you know, two kids, one is white, one is African American, they're both caught with marijuana, small amount for personal use, they go before a judge, depending on where they're living, I know some places it's legal, but other places it's not. The judge may see the white kid is coming from you know, a middle class household and his parents are there and, you know, gives him a fine and, you know, a few hours of um, picking up trash on the side of the road. For the African American kid, statistically, they are going to have a much harder time. And these are based on the real statistics from um, the U.S. government. Um, black kids are treated worse on their first offense. They're more likely to serve jail time and they're more likely to walk away with a felony instead of a misdemeanor. So we as you know um, therapeutic people need to understand that society isn't fair and that we have to sometimes work towards social justice. It is not just an issue of clinical efficacy. We need to work towards universal access to justice and equity for marginalized individuals and groups. Constantine, Hage, Kendaki, and Bryant have identified nine competencies they believe therapists should acquire in training and practice throughout their professional lives that will help them become more culturally competent. Number one, an awareness of oppression and social inequality. Number two, ongoing self-reflection with regard to race, ethnicity, oppression, power, and privilege. Number three, an understanding of the impact of practitioners' power and privilege on clients, communities, and research participants. Number four, active questioning and challenging of inappropriate or exploitive intervention practices. Number five, understand and share knowledge as appropriate about indigenous healing practices. You know, bringing in healing practices from a particular culture um, can be very helpful because really a, a lot of this is based on believing that it'll work, not necessarily a scientific basis and whether or not it actually does. 
Number six, an awareness of ongoing international social injustice. You know, right now, one of the big issues that affect women are um, female genital mutilation or female um, circumcision. And it is not a huge problem in the United States, but if you go to parts of the Middle East or Africa, you know, a lot of women do not want their daughters uh, circumcised. They remove the labia and clitoris because it can be dangerous health-wise. The woman no longer has that sexual ability to enjoy sex. And three, it subordinates women to men. It's this ongoing idea that women shouldn't enjoy sex. Um, so we have to be aware of these things. Number seven, a conceptualized, implemented, and evaluative mental health intervention program for the multicultural population. Number eight, collaboration with community organizations to provide culturally relevant services. And number nine, advocate change in the social system. So that's it for today. If you have any questions, please feel free to text or email your instructor. If you are not in our class but would like to ask a question, please leave a comment and we will reply as quickly as possible. Have a fabulous day. Thank you.